AI is an application that is running live. It's an application that is running all the time in a business. It's not running in batches that are triggered by a person. AI is running all the time. Therefore, businesses must implement live operations. Live ops is called live ops. It's a way of managing an application that is running live, is running all the time. I'm Matthias Kamber, a principal in the Hydrogen Struggles Zurich office and a member of the Global Industrial Technology Practice. In today's podcast, I'm excited to be joined by Pedro Uria Recchio, Chief Data Analytics and AI Officer at True Digital, the digital arm of Thailand's leading telecom company and Managing Director of True Analytics a corporate venture that builds data-driven enterprise solutions in advertising, credit risk, customer intelligence, and data enrichment. Here, Pedro managed large-scale analytics and AI transformation in South Asia. Prior to True Digital, Pedro worked at Axiata Group as Group Vice President of Data Analytics. Pedro, welcome and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much. I'm very happy, very honored to be part of this podcast. Pedro, to kick off this conversation, could you talk us through your journey in the technology and what drew you into the AI space? So I am an engineer by education and I got familiarized with AI during my education, particularly with neural networks, which we used to to use for handwriting recognition back in the 90s. Then I started my career working in research and development in France and in Hong Kong. At some point, I studied an MBA at the University of Chicago, Booth School of Business, and that gave me an entirely new perspective of my understanding of analytics and AI, which is the business perspective, right? So for example, how to use uh, analytics in order to improve marketing campaigns, in order to improve financial results, etc. right? And then after my MBA, I joined McKinsey & Company, where I started working with the first applications at scale of analytics in business in the early 2010s. And those applications were mainly around customer experience and marketing. And then I finally joined Axiata, became the group VP of data analytics, and then later through digital chief data analytics and AI officer, as, as you described. There's a lot of hype about generative AI. Um, since Jet GPT was open to the public late last year, can you tell us what generative AI is? Yeah, sure. So generative AI is causing a lot of global excitement. Uh, corporations are engaging in pilots, private equity uh, and, and, and venture capital is increasingly funding generative AI. The media loves it. Uh, developers are embracing it. Researchers are focusing on it. So there is a, a huge uh, boom in generative AI, right? Many of the technologies behind generative AI have actually been developed over the last years. So I said before that neural networks are quite old, but the newer technologies that are empowering uh, ChatGPT behind are things such as generative adversarial networks, variational autoencoders, foundational models, and a lot of newer technologies that have been developed over the last over the last 10 years. There is an explosion in in technical approaches for generative AI. And it is not only ChatGPT either. Uh, there are many exciting tools out there for human language recognition or generation uh, to, to program code, to generate audio, images, video, etc. right? So ChatGPT is just one of the many, many other, many tools out there. Um, and in general, uh, generative AI, when it comes to work, when it comes to, the, to, 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 to business can do two things. On the one hand, it can enable automation by giving human beings tasks or by giving human tasks to software, right? It can enable automation by giving things that humans used to do to software. And on the other hand, it can ab enable augmentation by providing humans with advanced tools and techniques to work more efficiently. These are the two things that Gen AI can do. More importantly, could you tell us the key business applications for generative AI? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, sure, sure. There are a lot of examples, yes. Um, so generative AI has versatile applications that span across core functions of, of a business, such as marketing, sales, 
product development, supply chain operations, engineering, all that, right? And also across the support functions, such as IT, finance, strategy, legal, uh, HR, recruitment, um, basically all, all the support functions, right? There are many startups out there focusing on a specific of these verticals that I have just mentioned. Um, so for example, in marketing, generative AI can write uh, marketing and sales content in form of text, in form of images, uh, videos. It can create also product guides, user guides, or, or help to create certain chapters of it, right? Um, and it can also analyze customer feedback by summarizing and extracting themes or sentiments uh, from, from the text of a conversation, a real conversation with a customer, for example, right? In terms of R&D, Generative AI can help engineers make 3D designs, uh, prototypes, prototypes of a website, prototypes of industrial pieces that you later print in 3D. And, and then for development and coding, which is where I am mainly working on, uh, Generative AI can help write code and documentation. It can help debug code. Right. When a code is failing, you don't know how to solve it, so Generative AI can help you. It can propose new versions of the same code so that it runs better or faster. Right? So there are many applications for programmers, data scientists that can use, can use Generative AI. Actually, some of the models of ChatGPT are specifically for programming. Right. Um, and I'm particularly also amazed by, by applications, for example, in, in support functions, let's say legal, right? So generative AI could draft uh, a legal document, could help you review a legal document. When you receive a new contract from another person, uh, it can possibly highlight what are the aspects of that contract that could be potentially problematic to you, where you should pay attention. So it can, it can also have many applications in legal HR. Generative AI's applications to business look impressive. I guess businesses will need to adapt how they operate to use this new technology profoundly. Yeah, you're right. They need to adapt, right? And, and, and businesses can adapt to use generative AI at three speeds in three ways, right? First speed will be the easiest one. And then the third one will be the most complex one. So firstly, they can start using off the shelf generative AI applications. They can use the products of these startups that I have mentioned before, and ChatGPT is just one of them, right? They can, they can just start using those products. And, and I guess that most of us, you, me, and many of the people listening to the, this podcast have already started using some of them, right? Secondly, the second thing they can do is they can connect these applications like ChatGPT to their business processes through APIs, or they can even run more open models on their corporate systems, right? Um, this is actually how ChatGPT makes money. ChatGPT is charging businesses to connect to their APIs so that businesses can use ChatGPT, for example, for customer service, right? This is how ChatGPT makes money. And the third approach, which is the most advanced one, is businesses can really adapt the, the generative AI models to their business context. They can train, for example, the generative AI with the product catalog of your company, or you can train it with the, the client data of your company, right? Uh, and this can involve advanced prompting, of course, right? So prompting uh, the AI with more advanced or, or uh, specific questions. But most importantly, and this is a little bit more difficult, it can involve different levels of fine tuning the AI models so that the AI model knows what your products are, what each customer that you have, who they are, uh, what they care about, uh, what is the segmentation of every customer. And uh, something important uh, to keep in mind when, when migrating or when adopting AI is that having been successful in, in adopting data analytics is actually a requirement to implement generative AI in an organization. So organizations that have not leveraged analytics at scale well are much worse positioned to implement AI uh, and risk being left behind as their competitors gain a strategic advantage, right? Because the process to implement AI is, is, is like the next step to implement analytics, right? First, you have to implement analytics, then you implement AI. 
And another thing that is quite important for me is one of the uh, my my very hard coded beliefs uh, based on my experience is that achievers, winning companies uh, in implementing AI, are not defined by the sophistication of what they implement, but they are defined by the consistency of combining strengths across strategy, processes, people, uh, in order to scale AI. Is the consistency, is not the sophistication. Based on these three implementation options, what new skill sets and capabilities will organizations need to seek in leaders to maximize their opportunities? Let's start with what are the jobs to be done uh, in order to implement generative AI, because the leaders are going to be people supervising these jobs, right? So the skills of leaders depend largely on, on, on what these new tasks and new activities are going to be to implement GNI. And businesses must develop a number of capabilities to be successful, right? Firstly, AI is uh, an application that is running live. It's an application that is running all the time in a business. It's not running in batches that are triggered by a person. AI is running all the time. Therefore, businesses ma must implement live operations. Life ops is called life ops. It's a way of managing an application that is running live, is running all the time. So businesses must implement live operations to monitor and maintain AI models. So you need people for that, uh, for that monitoring of the AI system and the maintenance, right? There are going to be jobs for that. Second, businesses also must uh, develop new talent capabilities, such as familiarity with deep learning frameworks and, and machine learning uh, uh, and engineering skill sets for large complex models. Uh, most companies, uh, particularly in emerging markets, which is where I am, most companies use very straightforward AI algorithms like logistic regressions, very simple algorithms. But those algorithms are, are not going to be useful anymore. We are going to the next level, which is deep learning, which is generative AI, right? So now you need to hire people who can work with complex ones, complex models, uh, and you need to refresh their machine learning. You need to refresh your machine learning development toolkit and your processes and your talent for that. So this is the second thing that you have to put in place. The third thing is uh, businesses also must adopt tools to adjust and, and fine tune these AI models that come by default like generative AI, there is a default version of it, but your business probably is going to need something that is fine-tuned to your own needs. And in order to do that, you need, you need engineers for that uh, because you have to adapt the AI to the context of your business. And then the number four will be businesses should also do an architectural design of how they're going to implement AI, right? Because there are many options that they have to choose from, right? They can choose whether uh, which of the different components are going to be in-house, which ones are going to be outsourced. They have to uh, evolve their technology stack accordingly. And that means a lot of jobs for data infrastructure people. And finally, obviously, there is change management, right? And change management is going to become very, very important. A lot of people are going to be working in change management for to adapt to AI in an organization. You will need uh, knowledge translators. We can call these people knowledge translators who are the people that can explain generative AI to business people, how to use prompts, etc. And you will also need uh, what is called a human in the loop because you should keep AI from running alone. I was saying before that AI is going to be running independently, it's going to be running live, but these applications make mistakes and someone has to be supervising that and being on charge. We call that person human in the loop. So successful business leaders are people who know these new jobs. Because AI is now going to be your new, your new colleague or it's going to be your new subordinate. So business leaders are people who understand how the new game is going to be played. What is the new kind of leader that will be able to manage this complexity? What skills do they require? Well, so, so generative AI is going to require, certainly, certainly it's going to require new approaches uh, to management and, and leadership. And the most important is who is going to be leading this change. So the leader 
of AI in an organization has to be a sea level. It cannot be a person below sea level. There is a study from a few years ago from McKinsey and Company about what is the top factor that differentiates winners from laggards in analytics. I was saying that analytics is very similar to AI when it comes to implementation. Uh, that factor in that research by, by McKinsey was the presence of a tech-savvy C-level champion who might have the title or might not have the title of chief data officer or analytics officer, but he's the person that is driving adoption in, in analytics, right? And as I am saying, the next evolution of analytics adoption is AI adoption. So having this C-level champion is also fundamental for, for AI adoption. And this C-level champion or champions require a number of personality traits and a number of skills. And for me, the most important ones is, by far the most important one is willingness to learn and experiment with new approaches that work alongside intelligent machines and, and algorithms, right? And ability to instill this culture of experimentation in the organization. That's the top one. Obviously, he needs to have a strong understanding of the company business processes and goals because you are driving applications of AI into the business. He or she needs to be a visionary, obviously being data-driven and having some experience with AI and, and, and machine learning, obviously that helps. And lastly, I will say that the ability to effectively communicate technical concepts to non-technical stakeholders is, is a very important quality. Gen AI raises several regulatory, legal and ethical questions for businesses and society. For example, how can ethical guidelines be established to ensure accountability and transparency in developing and using these systems? Well, absolutely. Uh, the generative AI is, is raising uh, several regulatory, legal, ethical questions for businesses and society. Um, and I'm going to tell you about some of them, right? So some questions that, that will have to be answered. Uh, probably we don't know how to answer them now, but, but we need to find a, a solution and we need to find an answer as a society. So number one, who owns the output generated by AI? Who owns an essay that is written by AI? Who owns that? And who is liable for any error or damage that is caused by it? Also, how can user data be protected? How can the privacy of data be protected? And how can user data be integrated to train AI systems? So, for example, ChatGPT, a few weeks ago, uh, announced that uh, they will not be using client data to train the default model of ChatGPT. And that is fundamental. That is very important. That basically means that when you are talking to ChatGPT, asking questions that are relevant to you. ChatGPT is not going to learn information about you that might tell other people. Or when you connect your product catalog or your customer database to ChatGPT through an API in your business, the default model of ChatGPT is not going to learn things about your customers, right? That protecting privacy in such a way is, is important. And there are other questions. So how can uh, these AI systems be unbiased? And how can avoid unfair situations or discriminations of different kinds? How can we create ethical guidelines uh, across across businesses, right? And and finally, accountability and transparency, I think, is important. So when a generative AI system, when an AI system is making a decision, is making a recommendation, can we know the reasons why? this recommendation is made? Is it transparent for a human auditor that wants to know, well, this recommendation you are making, ChatGPT or whatever AI system, what are the reasons why you come to that conclusion, right? Is, is it transparent? These are very important questions and, and, and we need to find a consensus about how to handle this. What is expected of businesses and leaders in this sphere? And do companies have the leaders they need to meet those expectations? Business leaders must first refresh their ethical framework to include many of these aspects that, that I have just mentioned um, related to AI. And some of them are well, regulatory compliance, data risk, explainability or interpretability of, of AI 
recommendations or decisions, data sharing, transparency, uh, reputational aspects as well, right? Like, uh, for example, appearance of offensive content or, or bias uh, in, in, in the content generated by, by AI. There has to be uh, a new ethical framework that is relevant to each business about how to handle these things. And this is one of the, one of the things business leaders need to do. How do you see the job market changing due to generative AI? Generative AI and AI in general is going to automate a lot of tasks that used to be done by people and they are related to jobs, right? And I, and I mentioned uh, some of them, but Gen AI is also going to create new opportunities, new, new jobs. And the adoption of generative AI is going to lead to changes in the job market because some skills will be in demand and other skills are not going to be in demand. And this change is going to happen faster, much faster than, than we think. It's going to happen over the next few years. So what is going to happen? Well, jobs involving tasks in front of a keyboard, such as programming, data science, marketing, secretarial activities, are going to be much more susceptible to automation. And they are going to see a decrease in demand. And therefore, they are going to see a decrease in salaries, which can be problematic for, for a lot of people. But conversely, jobs requiring, I would say, interpersonal skills, creativity, problem solving, emotional intelligence, uh, jobs such as consulting, sales, people management, those jobs that are related to people are less likely to be automated and they might see an increase in demand and therefore they're going to see a, an increase in, in, in salaries. And obviously, the, we also have, as a particular case, we have the new jobs required to actually implement AI and those are going to be very much in demand and, and people working in those areas will, will have very competitive salaries. A few years ago, in 2019, I did a, a TED Talk about the impact of AI in, in the workplace. And, and, and the topic of the, that tech talk, that was in 2019, it was called AI will make the workplace more human and not less. And I was talking about these changes in jobs, right? How those jobs that are more uh, related to interpersonal skills, more human in that sense, will be less automated. And those jobs that are more repeatable, more about, I would say, brute intelligence, uh, are going to be more likely to be automated. So I did this tech talk in 2018, but obviously at that time, I could never imagine this will happen so fast. And as I'm saying, it's going to come really, really fast in the next few years. Looking ahead, what advice would you give to leaders wanting to help their organizations meet their strategic AI goals in the future? If there is only one thing that I would like business leaders listening to this podcast to remember uh, is to keep learning. Uh, so AI is going to bring a lot of changes to your businesses, to your jobs, uh, and it is your ability to learn fast and experiment fast what is going to make the difference, what is going to make you a winner. So as a leader, that will be my top recommendation. Um, as a business, there are a few uh, best practices. There are already reports. For example, Accenture this week published a report about what, what is the difference between those companies or the, the, the differentiating factors between those companies that uh, are winning in AI implementation and those that are not? And, and it's quite interesting. So Mac, Accenture identified five uh, factors, and I totally agree with them. The first one is actually the existence of, the, of, a, of a champion that is leading in AI. And this is what I say before. So the first one is something that I totally agree with. Second one is investing heavily in talent. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, number three is industrializing AI tools and teams to create a strong AI core. Number four is designing AI responsibly. We have also talked about that, about all these technical, ethical and regulatory issues. And number five is prioritizing long and short-term investing, right? Uh, not only focusing on quick wins, but also investing in platforms that are going to help implementing more transformational changes in the business down the road, right? Uh, these are the key differentiating factors for a business and for a person. The ability to learn is the most important thing. 
That's, that's what I would say. This is very fascinating. Pedro, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much, Matthias.